I wonder, did you have joy this week? Did you experience happiness and joy? I severely hope that you did. Perhaps that if you did though, I'm going to suggest that that, that joy was because you enjoyed a level of success in your life. Certainly by this world's definition of success and perhaps that was at work. Maybe work went well and for some reason it, it brought you a smile uh, to your face. I know that when work went well for me um, that meant a bigger commission so it brought a, a smile to my, to my face and um, a level of joy I, I guess. Maybe it was a great holiday. Have you ever had one of those holidays that were massive? Uh, massive encouragement to you and, and they made you smile, they made you happy. Maybe it was your grandchildren, they, they've done well at school and, and that brings, brings a smile to your face. We had a family wedding recently and I think it went well and, and it brought us joy. We celebrate a big birthday this week as well and, and that brings us joy and, and, and happiness. And then as Christians of course there's success, there's ministry success in our, our Christian walk. And if lots of children turn up at our, Christ, at our Lego club, we're excited about it, aren't we? We're really happy and we think God has blessed us. We, we have joy. Maybe we, it's the, the fellowship lunch. We have we great time there. Uh, and we leave here buzzing uh, because we've had good fellowship, great fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Maybe you've been trying hard to outreach to a neighbor or to a friend uh, at work. Um, and when that goes well, it brings a sort of encouragement, doesn't it? A joy. And that's all good. These are good things. There's, there's no need to be guilty uh, about those things. But in today's passage, the passage we have just read, we break into this scene where 70 or 72, depending on, on your version, of, of Jesus' followers have returned after another mission that Jesus has sent them out to do. And on this mission, they have enjoyed great success. And they come back and they're buzzing. We can see that. Um, have a look at verse 17. The 72 returned. What with? They returned with joy. And they're filled with joy because they've enjoyed this, this ministry or mission success. And they go on, Lord, even the demons, even like our, the, the strongest of our, our enemies, submit in, in your name because of us and they're buzzing because of their ministry success I wonder did you experience joy this week maybe you didn't maybe you had one of those roller coasters of a week you started off on, on monday on the mountaintop and by tuesday and so so soon and so quickly you're down in, in the valley of depression and doubt jesus has has something really important to teach us, his children, about joy. Oh, this passage, Warren Wearsby, author and pastor, said this about the passage. He said, there is a threefold joy in this passage. The joy of service, the joy of salvation, and the joy of God's sovereignty. And that's how we'll break this, this passage down. And today and the first thing we will see that the disciples have experienced joy in service and that's great but the thing is and Jesus knows it that their joy is closely linked to their success at that time the two are linked but life isn't always like that is it and Jesus knows this sometimes there's success Sometimes, but most times in this fallen sinful world, there are struggles. Jesus knows this. You need to go to work, but, but your work is a, a nightmare. What about family? As much as we love them. Isn't that a strange contradiction? How much we can love our, our families, but they can still bring us so much pain at the same time. And then don't even go there about money and the cost of living at the moment and, and church church can be the, the most difficult thing of the lot for the believer 
And Jesus knows. Jesus knows that joy and success are not necessarily connected. There's something else. But nonetheless, the, the disciples come back from their, their mission and they're buzzing. They're, they're up there. They're, they're glowing. They have this exciting report. And perhaps Jesus doesn't react in the way that, that they expected he would react. But before we, we look at Jesus' reaction, and we want to do that today, I want you to consider this as we think about joy, okay? Just think about this. Um, yesterday I did a little bit of work uh, about, the, about the house, and what, I, what did I need? I needed a spirit level. Have a look around you. Um, most things in this room are, are level, apart from the stuff Sam and me have fitted, but most of the stuff is level and, and somebody at some point took a spirit level out and, and they found the, the reference point by looking at the wee bubble spirit levels fascinate me I could play with one for hours but the wee bubble always returns to the right place and shows you where level is and we need that, that reference point to be in like this instead of like this and, and without that reference point nothing is straight just isn't uh, finding true joy we want joy. I think we're all in agreement with that today. We want joy. We want to experience Christian joy if we trust Christ. But finding true Christian joy is a bit like that because lasting joy, deep joy, real joy needs a reference point. And if your reference point for your joy is your youth, for example, how will you feel when you get old and, and chubby? and bald for example and your looks fade and maybe it's your health maybe you're you're delighted with your health you're happy you're you're, you're fit and, and well but, but one day that will fail it will fail so, sooner or later it will fail what then and, and then there's children and grandchildren sometimes we live through them don't we we what we didn't have in life we 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 try to pull our joy back through them but, but here's another thing we need to be aware of because before long you are going to become the, the saddest thing that ever walked on two legs um, to, to those children. You will be an embarrassment to them. <laughs> will you have joy then? And if it's money, if it's materialism, what, what's going to happen when that's taken away? Will you, will you have joy? We need something more. But what is that reference point? First thing, sorry, the second thing we're, we're going to look at then is, is joy. We've looked at joy as we serve, but joy because we're saved. Okay, so let's look at that a little bit deeper. Joy because we are saved. Have a look at verse 18. If your Bible's still open, verse 18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus is about to reveal something to the disciples. He, he wants to, to introduce this, this reference point for lasting joy, for, for real joy, for a believer. And that's important to remember. This is for the believer. But Jesus doesn't go straight to the point he's about to make. What, what he does first, he lays this foundation to build on before he moves forward. To, to reveal that reference point. And so, so Jesus starts with, with two facts that he wants them to know that are helpful and that are helpful for us today. And so in, in verse 18, he makes a sort of random statement. Think, think about what has happened here. The disciples come back buzzing. and they want to tell Jesus about how, how good it's been, uh, their ministry success. Do they get a pat on the back? Do they get, uh, well done lads, let's do this again next week no jesus makes this sort of random statement i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven you see we can only understand what's in front of us or, or perhaps even what happened yesterday what, what's happening right now that's all that we can see and, and understand but jesus and as we've been thinking about today the ancient of days and he is the ancient of days he has seen the past 
he has seen the present and he has seen the future. And we don't think like that, but he does past, present and future. Jesus has seen the defeat, the ultimate defeat of his enemy, Satan. He has seen the, the, the ultimate defeat of our enemy, of the believer's enemy, Satan. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And Jesus sees things from an eternal perspective. We've got to remember that. He sees things that we don't see. Before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus shares the good news of his victory with them. I saw Satan fall. Jesus has seen that, that victory and he sees the past, he sees the present and he sees the future. And to help us understand this, uh, what, what Jesus is about to say next, it's important to look back then to Genesis 3.15. And we, we, I just want to go through this victory, past, present and, and future. But Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Present, that, that victory continues for us in our lives. Hebrews 2.14, as we think about the cross and the victory we have for today. Through his death, he, Jesus, might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. There's victory for today. And then there's the future. Revelation 21 to 3. These will wage war against the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome. Because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And Jesus ultimately defeats Satan and sin and the consequences of sin and the punishment of sin by taking the punishment upon himself at the cross. Jesus takes the wrath of God, the punishment that would be ours if we don't repent. He takes it upon himself at Calvary and the cross. And so at Calvary, Satan struck Jesus' heel. Let's think about that for a wee moment. Satan does, there's where it happens, he he, he hurts Jesus to an extent. And yes, Satan did that. And as Jesus lay in the tomb for a time, from Friday to Sunday morning, it looked like it looked like Satan had the victory. Until, of course, Jesus rises again, and physical and spiritual death are defeated for those who will put their faith and their trust in Jesus. So yes, at, at Calvary, Satan bruises Jesus' heel, but Jesus crushes Satan's head and the lamb overcomes. In the context of their joy, so that the disciples would know joy, so that we who sit here in Shankill Community Fellowship today will know joy. Jesus wants us to understand that, that we are fighting a battle that he has already won. We are fighting a battle that he has already won. The disciples have had joy because of their success, because they were involved in this, this battle. And that, that's brilliant. But they really did need to be careful that they didn't fall into that trap and the thinking that the blessing and salvation are are linked. The joy depended on success. Jesus reminds them that that, that joy isn't performance related. And Jesus keeps moving them forward in this passage as he develops this, this idea. And before he reveals that reference point of real joy. So let's recap. The first thing is that Jesus has seen Satan's defeat. Deal done at Calvary. The war is won. And the second fact then is that, that Jesus shares with them is, yes, the war is won. Absolutely, there's, there's no doubt about that. But there are still battles to be fought. There are still battles for us to fight. 
And so have a look at verse 19 then as he leads them, them into that. So remember the war's been won, but there's still battles to be fought. And Jesus says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Nothing will harm you. So Friday is St. Patrick's Day. Um, I guess it's not a massive celebration and on the shankle, but you know, a good part of America are going to celebrate nearly 2,000 years of Christianity in Ireland by getting blitzed on green beer. Um, we, we have this legend as well that, that St. Patrick sort of banned all the snakes from Ireland, certainly the, the poisonous ones. There's churches in America who, in a sincerity, I, I think even, in, in trying to be faithful to this verse and other verses like them, literally lift poisonous snakes. And what, what happens? They, they get bit. They, they get sick. And, and some even die. But this, this passage and this reference to the serpent and, and the snake it's not an invitation to take mindless risks. That's not what this is about. This is an invitation. This is an invitation to join with Jesus in his mission. To stamp on Satan's head. To stamp on the serpent's head. It's a gospel thing. And Jesus knows. That's why he has this strange response to, to their, their excitement. He knows that sharing the good news of the gospel isn't going to bring, inverted commas, success by this world's standards. Jesus knows that sometimes what, what he was asking them to do was going to be dangerous. It would be costly. And the snake would bruise the disciples heel too. And they would die. And that happens to us today. Sometimes the snake bruises our heel. But Jesus is telling his, his followers that those who carry the gospel message, that those who share the gospel message uh, as they join with him, sometimes it's a dangerous mission to crush the serpent's head. But Jesus gives his gospel messengers authority. He gives an authority. And he gives protection to us as we share the gospel. They would win battles. And sometimes for a time, it would look like they had lost battles. But he wants them to remember. You're fighting a battle that I've already won. So then, and it's only then that after this foundation is laid, he lays this foundation that, that reveals that reference point for joy, for our joy, for Christian joy. And we'll see that in verse 20. Have a look at verse 20. Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names, have, be, have joy that your names are written in, in heaven. Rejoice that you're saved. Rejoice that I have saved you. Jesus is saying here, I love you anyway. Success or, or no success, I've seen Satan defeated. I defeated him for you. I bought you back with my own blood. It's a covenantal thing that we're seeing here hymn writer put it like this if you Jesus my discharge procured and freely in my place endured the whole wrath divine payment God will not twice demand first at my bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine Believer, have joy today that Jesus has saved you. If you're a Christian, there's where we will always be able to draw on that pool of joy. 
And sometimes you will feel like giving up. There's no doubt about that. You will feel like, like giving up. The, the prophet Habakkuk was, was having one of those moments when, when he wrote this. He said, though the fig tree may not blossom. He's writing about the lack of success when things go wrong in our lives. Listen, listen to this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, and though the labour of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. How do you find joy on days like that when it's all going the wrong way? Well, let me finish what, what Habakkuk began. This, this, this is how he, he finished that, that, that passage. He said, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He understands that, that reference point, that, that, that real, the joy of God's people is in their salvation and nothing else. If you're a believer today, then, then rejoice that Jesus has saved you. Don't rejoice that the Spirit submit to you or that your ministry success, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Let's look at that third and last thing. Joy because God is in control. Joy because God is in control. What's happening in your life today? What happened last week? If you're a Christian, try to put that to the side and rejoice in the fact that you, you are saved. In these verses here, verses 21 to 3, it's like Jesus has taken his ruler and a pen and he's put a big underline uh, under what he's already said with this amazing truth. Do you know that everything that happens in your life is under God's control? <coughs> Just pause for a moment and think about that. Everything that happens in your life is under God's control. God has allowed it. And Jesus is speaking here in the context of your own salvation, your eternal security. You know, if you're a believer here today, it's not by accident. It isn't because you're smart enough or I was smart enough to work out how things work. It's not fate or coincidence that you came to Christ, your own testimony. So let's, let's focus just as we come to an end on the phraseology that Jesus uses here regarding God being in control. Verse 21. Again, just think of this in, in the context of salvation. Verse 21, you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and yet he didn't hide it from you or me. Verse 21 continues, yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. If God the Father was pleased to do. Verse 22, no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Verse 22, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but you did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but you did not hear it. Why, why does Jesus say this in the, in the context of what he's already said? It seems we kind of random phrases, but they're not, they're, they're all tied up. And maybe you're a Christian today and, and you can't grasp that joy. You, you're losing joy for, for some reason because you're struggling with your own failures. You're struggling with your, your own um, sinfulness. And, and you're thinking, well, how could God love me? How could he love me? Many Christians have no assurance that God loves them. Are you, do you have an assurance that, that when you die, you will go to heaven? Maybe you, you came to the Lord, but you're doubting that. And you have moments of doubting that. And if you died today, where would, would you be? Well, let me tell you, we all have those thoughts. We, I think we all should have those thoughts uh, as well. 
But today you sit here, you want to believe that you're saved, but you just can't. You need assurance. Think about what Jesus has just told the disciples here. He's saying that your salvation is not dependent on your own performance. Their salvation, your salvation, my salvation depends on what Jesus has done at Calvary. And Jesus reinforces this uh, as he explains this to them with this massive truth. And Jesus is telling these guys to, to remember that, that God in his grace and his mercy reached down and saved them and he chose to do that. He chose to do that. Remember that, that Paul tells us that we are chosen. When? When are we chosen? Before the foundation of the, of the earth. Think about that. It's probably a really bad uh, illustration, but I, I once had the, the joy and the pleasure of going to choose a dog. And, and when I went in, there were, were wee Yorkies all over the place. And I chose one. And when I chose that wee dog, Summer's granny, see her smiling, tied a wee ribbon on, on the dog's neck. And a month or so later, I came back and I, I reclaimed the, my puppy, the one that I had, had chosen. And now, now I, I chose that wee dog. I can give her the name Daisy. And, and I'm not going to let that dog down. I'm going to care for her. She's in my care because she is the puppy that I chose. That's a really bad illustration, but, but I want you to think about that, that choice. Because, folks, God didn't choose you to turn around down the road and then say, I, I give up on them and that they're just too bad. That, that doesn't happen. God didn't choose you to let you down when, when things get difficult. He's already pointed that out, that our salvation isn't dependent on our own performance. Listen to John 10, 28. I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Remember verse 20 here? Rejoice that your names are written, are written in heaven. And Jesus reassures these guys those who are trusting in him and, and would one day, when, when it all became clear, would trust in, in his sacrifice at, at Calvary. Jesus reassures them, he reassures us that our names will never be removed from the list of names that exists in heaven today. Now think about that as well. Your name, say it into yourself, say your name. It is written on a list in heaven. And today, Jesus himself is protecting the, the place, the right to the, your name on that, that list. Jesus himself protects that. Him writer put it like this. And with this, I finish. He said this, the work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yes and amen and never was forfeited yet. Things future nor things that are now, not all things below or above can make him his purpose forego or sever my soul from his love. Three things to rejoice in today. Joy in service. And that service isn't performance related. Joy that we are saved. And joy that our salvation is secure in Jesus. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your word today. We thank you for the encouragement of, of your word and we we thank you that Lord you, you love us anyway we are fighting a battle that you have already won Lord Lord we thank you then that all we have to do is trust and when, when we don't enjoy success 
when, when things don't go our way or, or the way we think that you want them to go, that you love us anyway. We thank you that because of Calvary, we thank you for that covenant of love. We thank you that, that you bought us and, and purchased us and brought us back through your blood and nothing can change that. You will not look again for payment and we are secure in that. So we, we thank you for our salvation and we do rejoice today in the fact that we are saved. And we pray that your words of assurance will just continue through, through the next week until we meet again, just reassuring us that our names are written in heaven uh, and that you, you protect the, the right of that name uh, to be there. On you we depend, Lord Jesus, to you we give the glory and it is in your name that we pray this. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Andrew. Thank you, Andrew.